Should I give up or should I just keep reading this book even if it leads nowhere? Oh, would it be a waste even if I knew it's fate? Should I leave it there? Should I give up or should I just keep on reading it? Should I just keep on reading it? Oh. I am running out of ideas for song lyrics and I'm sorry that this one was so high pitched, but I, I just, I wanted to do it. I'm really sorry. Hello beautiful bookworms, my name is Katarina and welcome to my channel and today we have a good old-fashioned book haul so we have the book haul for the month of love, February and most of the books that I got are horror <laughs> which encompasses my feelings exactly about the month of February to be quite honest I am one of those people that do really enjoy see some romantic comedies and some lovey-dovey movies but not most of the time and so me and my boyfriend actually have this ritual in which on valentine's day we actually watch horror movies because it's our favorite genre and just really we don't have the patience to <laughs> to watch those famous movies uh, romance movies like i like some I will tell you right here and there I like some but I just I don't have the patience to endure every year and to make a marathon of them so without further ado let's just get into the books that I got for this month so the first one that I have is sort of a graphic novel and it is called Night Bus by Zuma and I am not exactly sure what this story is about it is a big chunk of a graphic novel um it says in the back journey through the countryside and this magical realist debut from an underground chinese cartoonist and i love um asian-based stories since i do believe that they normally portray emotions in a different way than european stories or american stories do and i do enjoy the way they portray emotions and i also love the topics that are normally recommended and to see that as a magical realism story I was really really hyped up um, and in the back it says night bus depicts sleepy starry bug swarm countrysides far away from the turmoil I currently experience the book sparked far off memories of catching bugs and chance encounters with strange kids and adults doing things I found puzzling and objectionable these memories made me want to fall into a coma and escape the oppressive stress of city life the depictions of mundane existence concerns about the elderly and Zuma's own career path drift seamlessly into moody creature fantasies that at times escalate into full-on kaiju sequences. The darkened cinematic faces linger, Zuma's line captures architecture and vehicles in a way that feels easily dashed off but only comes after years of practice. I, I mean... It sounds beautiful, I don't know, I it kind of gives me the feel of My Neighbor Totoro, if you've ever seen that um, movie, uh, that animated movie. I, I don't know why, <laughs> maybe because there's a cat buzz in there, but it kind of sounds beautiful. The art style of this is very unique and it has that nostalgia feeling that people are talking about and the countryside feeling, um, so I guess it's going to be fun. Then we have two typical presences in my book hauls and that is the Joker issue 11 written by James Tinian IV, Giuseppe Camuncoli in the pencils, Cam Smith, Lorenzo Ruggiero and Adriano Di Benedetto in inks and for colors Arif Prianto and Romulo Fajardo Jr. And then it has a punchline thingy. Uh, so I get this every month. Uh, I have already read this at the time that I'm filming this, which was at the very beginning of the month. Um, I enjoy it. It is finally going forward a little bit. The last one is kind of a flashback thingy, a filler thingy. I am enjoying this. Um, but I think it started out incredibly strong and now the strength is diminishing. Um, but yeah, it's still enjoyable if you like the Joker character and especially Gordon's character since this is following um, Detective Gordon. Another one that in inversely is now gaining more attention from me and actually being 
very pleasant because I already read it as well um, when it started out really terribly is the Joker presents a puzzle box and this one is issue six and this one is written by Matthew Rosenberg and the artists are Juan Joe, Jesus Marino and Vicente Cifuentes um, because it has a lot of different artists for each of, of the issues and this one is getting better with each issue which I have to admit the first two were like my least favorite issues of last year but now I am very interested it's not my favorite Joker story at all but it's funny and it has cool art style and it has points of view of different villains and it's Gotham and it's going to have a mystery there so I like it then we have Something is Killing the Children, Volume 4. This one is by James Tynion IV, Werder de la Dera, and Mikel Muerto. And I have read the first three volumes and they kind of close the first arc of Something is Killing the Children. And now we have finally fucking Volume 4 and I am so excited. This sort of has Stranger Things kind of vibes but a little bit more gory. Um, it's about these monsters that can only be seen by children and this kind of uh, secret society that hunts them. And our main character has a lot of secrets and she's a girl that it's not fully into the society, but also not outside of the society. She has some past trauma and everything. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy. And this one in the back says, the birth of a slaughter, which... I think it's going to be about the backstory of our main character of the first three and I cannot wait for that, so excited. And then I have another graphic novel that is called The Many Deaths of Layla Starr and this is by Rem V and Philippe Andrat. Um, and this one I wasn't familiar with but I was gifted this one and it has a very interesting premise and the art style of this is pretty beautiful and it says humanity is on the verge of discovering immortality. As a result, the avatar of death is cast down to earth to live a mortal life in Mumbai as a 20-something Layla star. Struggling with her newfound mortality, Layla has found a way to be dropped in the time and place where the creator of immortality will be born. Will Layla take her chance to stop mankind from permanently altering the circle of life, or will death really become a thing of the past? And it says, a powerful new graphic novel from award-winning writer Rem V um, and lauded illustrator Philippe Andrade that explores the fine line between living and dying through the lens of magical realism. And if we know something is that I really enjoy magical realism, so I'm curious to see how it will be portrayed in this one. Um, it sounds nice and the art style is beautiful, so I really want to check it out and maybe do a review after that. Then we have a manga, and I don't really know how this is pronounced, but I'm going to risk it, and it is Semel... Semel Paris, apparently. Semel Parus? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, but this is by Juan Ogino, and this is a strange blend of sapphic romance, mecca, and dystopia. Dystopia is something that I don't enjoy reading in actual books, unless it is 1984, because that one is perfection. Um, however, I have discovered by looking at my manga collection that it's something that I actually enjoy to read in manga format, maybe because there's art style and I can understand better what is going on because I don't have that intelligence to portray an entire dystopian world in my mind. Um, or maybe because it's just fun to see the exaggeration in manga. Um, however, this one sounds and looks very nice. The art style of this is really cool. Um, it does have a parental advisory of explicit content, so I'm not sure if it's for violence or for sexual innuendos. Um, but it does say, Yuri love is a battlefield. And it says, ever since they were young girls, best friends Yurino and Aruka have been training to join the ranks of the bulwarks. Soldiers who defend humanity from the kaiju trying to break through. But when Haruka is killed during a routine drill, Yurino's world is shattered. Will she ever be able to open her heart to another? Strap in for intense apocalyptic romance. And it does look like it will have a lot of fight scenes with mechanical monsters and a lot of training and heroes. And I don't know, it kind of looks like something that I might enjoy. I might do a review on this first volume. 
if I don't like it, then I won't continue. I don't know. It sounds fun. Then talking about dystopian that might be kind of sci-fi, that might be kind of mechanical, we are going right to Cytonic by Brandon Sanderson. And this is book three in the Skyward series, which is sort of his young adult sci-fi-ish series, sci-fi fantasy, because this one is not a very hard sci-fi. The only sci-fi things that it has is sort of aliens and spaceships and planet stuff it, it's not very it's it's more of a space opera really than an actual sci-fi um it's also young adult as i think that i've already said so it's not very difficult uh, however i have read skyward the first one and really enjoyed it which i wasn't expecting since i have a difficult relationship with sci-fi books um so i've got the second one and now the third one which is released last year um and yeah i'm hyped to get to this the cover of this is also beautiful all golden and black and very planetarian sort of thing so excited to know why this is called cytonic since i i don't really understand why yet but i i believe that i will eventually then we have um the fifth book in the night garden series which I've been slowly collecting, um, and that is Dusky Dahlia, and this is by Lucy Holden. And this is an indie uh, paranormal vampire romance, which I have read Red Magnolia as an e-arc um, by Nat Galley, and I liked it so much that I purchased it and the rest of the series. So, Dusky Dahlia is the fifth one. I know nothing about this because I've only read the first one, <laughs> so I have to catch up. Uh, which is fine because I have the rest of them in here. Um, but I do know there's going to be seven books, but they're all very, very small. This one has like, what? Mm, 190 pages. So you can see that they're very short novellas. Um, they're very interesting though. It's a new concept of vampire paranormal romance. Of course, it does have some similarities to others and you already know that I'm trash for that genre. So here it is. Then I have a Valentine's Day gift, and that is A Gentleman in Moscow by Immortales, which I think this is how you pronounce this person's name. Um, and this, it says, a life without luxury can be the biggest luxury of them all. Um, this is in Portuguese. Uh, I love, I absolutely love this cover. It's all golden and black, and it's hardcover, as you can see. It's a perfect edition for this. I do have a Mortalis first book. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I'm pretty sure that I'm going to love it because I do believe that his books are sort of like the Great Gatsby-esque, but Russian-inspired, which I like Russian classics, the ones that I've read. I adore The Great Gatsby and the 1920s sort of vibe, so I do believe that this is going to be interesting. Um, and it says, I'm going to try and translate the back for you. Um, sorry if it's not well translated. And it says, because of a poem, a Bolshevik court um, kind of imprisons Count Alexander Rostov to kind of sentence him to home prison. Uh, and so he's going to be held by indeterminate time in the Metropole Hotel. Um, it's a golden prison, but it's a prison. And so it's June... 1922 so he's in a luxurious hotel and then he starts to uh observe russia's transformation and um i mean he he talks to other people that are in the hotel and he sees what is going on um in russia in real time and i don't know it kind of it kind of looks amazing um it has some other people also in the hotel for very different reasons um, and it says it's a melancholic work, uh, and it's an epic novel um, that has an unforgettable gallery of characters, and it's served by an elegant writing, uh, rarer in contemporary literature, so excitement. I Oh, and it matches my sweater! <laughs> uh, it, it really matches my sweater. I'm, I'm very excited to pick this up. I really love these types of things. The kind of debauchery of the 1920s associated with actual problematic societal situations um, that have to be addressed and most of the time are not. So yeah, it, it sounds great. And now I have a bunch of Hindi horror novels which I am extremely happy about since I've discovered some of these authors recently and I've read some of these works 
of their works actually and uh, some I've only seen and I really wanted to pick up these books. So the first two are part of the series and it's an ongoing series. The next book is coming out on March. Um, I don't know exactly the date, but it's coming out on March. And I have already read the first one in January since I had an e-arc for that one sent to me by the author himself. Um, but I am currently trying to start the second one and I don't know if by the time this comes out I have done a review or not, but if so, I will leave it linked somewhere. And that is the Price Manor series. So the first one is The House That Burns by Mike Salt. And the second one is The House That Bleeds by Jamie Stewart. And first of all, the covers for these are amazing. Um, this is um, by the Bedline Collective, I think. I think that's the name of the printer um, and it's amazing. The Price Manor series is a horror series and it's a haunted house story but very different since it is written by very different people. So each author has a book and even though some characters might appear or not appear in different books, it's not a direct sequel, um, but it's about this manor called Price Manor, and that's a haunted manor. And the manor just appears anytime, anywhere, when it wants to claim human lives. And it's about the people that go in, and why they go in, and will they come out. And it's just, for those of you that like haunted horror house stories, at least the first one that I've already read, but I'm pretty sure the second will be as well, they're amazing, and I do recommend that you start reading the Price Matter series. However, in the first one at least, and I'm pretty sure in the second one as well, for the reviews that I've been seeing, there are trigger warnings, so you better go check those out before you start these ones. But I highly recommend if you're into indie authors and if you're into horror to get these, because I am a lover of haunted house stories, and at least the first one was one of the best that I've ever read, and I'm pretty sure that the second one is going to be too. Then I have Elkin, A Tale of Folk Horror by J. Alexander, and this is kind of a novella, basically. It's really extremely short, as you can see, and it has a really beautiful and dark uh, back, and it says, Elkin, A Tale of Folk Horror, called out to the unexplored Sorrow Helm forests in the early 1970s, Elderly cartographer Wilbur Roman soon finds that the woods are near impossible to map, and that he's very, very far from alone out here. Trails of bones and antlers, mysterious rock figures, and strangely behaving creatures all lead him to the same devastating conclusion. There is something terrible out there, and it wants him. And it's just... I am hoping that it's a Wendigo. If it's not a Wendigo... What's the name of the other one that has antlers? Shit, I don't remember. I don't care. It's, I love folk horror with creepy creatures in the forest. And this cover is beautifully done. And this is um, by Pale Horse Press. And it will be featured, this tale, in the Starving Grounds Tales of Folk Horror, which is coming on June 2022. Um, but I wanted to read this now because I wanted to. It sounds amazing. Then we have Mike Salt's name again, and I got The House on Arlen by Mike Salt. First of all, cover, gorgeous, and from what I gather, this appears to be also a haunted house story, but I've heard the author himself say that's not quite what it is, so I'm intrigued, I'm intrigued. And it said, when reluctant sellout Alex and his family moved to a Harlem Drive, they soon discover that their idyllic suburban house is not the safe haven it first seems. In fact, there's nothing safe about the house in Harlem at all. In this thrilling new novella from Mike Salf, author of The Valley and Dem to Hell, which I haven't read, you are invited to step inside the house on Ireland, a house where the things that go bump in the night come out in force, a house that is hungry for blood, a house that will hunt you, a house with a little black door in the cellar, which... creepy! <laughs> but yeah, if there was a little black door in my fucking cellar, it wouldn't happen. I would go away, but <laughs> apparently these people did not. <laughs> And it says, a door that opens both ways. And as Alex is about to find out, the thing that come through aren't all there is to fear in this house. No, the real danger is waiting for him on the other side. 
So I'm guessing hell creatures? I don't know, but extremely intrigued. Then we have Those You Killed by Christopher Badcock. And I... This has got to be the one I'm most excited about. I'm just going to read the premise and then you will gather why I'm so excited. It says, best-selling author, husband, father, junkie. Elwood Cathis gave up everything for the needle. Desperate to rebuild a relationship with his daughter and his ex-wife, he's come to Lake Chance, a once bustling vacation hotspot not caught in the throes of a prolonged demise. Tainted and scarred by past events, it's a place that echoes his own existence. Echoes. Something echoes. It calls out like a forgotten broadcast stuck on repeat. Something in the forest, something infernal that only he and others like him can hear. The lost, the weak, the tormented. Suffering with intense withdrawal and plagued by nightmarish visions, Elwood will confront the lake's dark past and in doing so uncover parts of himself he lost at the tip of a needle and so much more. A tale of love, loss, addiction and memory, Those You Killed is the story of one man's inner turmoil becoming outer terror. And I absolutely love this. As a psychologist, um, I did my major in psychology of deviant behavior, which here in Portugal is kind of understood as addictive behavior, so drugs, um, TV addiction, internet addiction and others. Also, um, uh, victims of domestic violence and abusers in domestic violence or others, um, court cases and other situations that are extremely unpleasant. So it's like the justice side of things. Uh, so in a professional level, this really interests me. And in a horror kind of genre level, this also interests me since my favorite horror genre is psychological horror and it seems that we're going to have a lot of it in here. As well as someone that actually has generalized anxiety disorder and it does struggle with the monster inside of the mental illness itself. Um, I'm also very intrigued to see how um, Christopher Badcock just explains the monster inside in an addiction. Um, so I am incredibly intrigued for this one. This one is a little bit bigger, um, but I think it's going to be extremely worth it. And also the last one that I got for these is The Miracle Sin, and this is by Marcus Hawk. Um, the back of it says, have you ever wondered if there is more to life? If we are destined for something great, if we are part of a divine plan rather than just subjects of random chaos? Mason Cole has wondered these, these things, and he has the answer. No. How could it be when his parents were killed in a cataclysmic earthquake, yet he alone survived? How could it be destined for great things when he's stuck in a town-shaped rest stop where nothing he does makes a difference? And why would God do this to him in the first place? And one day a stranger passes through town, bringing with him a unique explanation of his past, one he never could have imagined and wishes he could forget. Now, with a red-haired devil hell-bent on possessing him for his own sinister games, Mason must discover the answers to these questions if he ever hopes to survive in a world where the dark no longer hides the things that dwell there. So it kind of looks like religious horror, which um, I have sort of a strange relationship with religious horror. I am very scared by possession stories, although I really love The Exorcist and The Exorcism of Emily Rose. I tend to not watch... Um, demons and possession stories or horror movies and read those types of books because they get me uncomfortable. I am not exactly comfortable um, in the way that my beliefs work. Um, I normally say that I believe in energies and in nature and in our connections and not exactly in the God itself. But since I grew up sort of in Catholicism, Sometimes I, I wonder stuff, and this book kind of looks like it's going to get me thinking about the stuff that I don't want to think. But I also think that reading, generally, but specifically reading horror, is about getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, obviously not triggering yourself, because that might be complicated to deal with, but getting out of your comfort zone and asking the real hard questions. Um, I also want to know where Marcus Hawk is going to go with this. So I'm incredibly excited for this one. So the last two comics in this book haul are 
Dog Days, Stray Dogs, Issue 1 and Issue 2. I do believe these are the variant covers of these issues and if you don't know, these are some short stories in the Stray Dogs world, which I haven't read the trade paperback yet, but I am fairly excited to do so. And this one says, from Master of Canine Comic Terror, Tawny M. Fleeks and Trish Forstner. Um, New stories by Tony Fleeks, Trish Forstner, Tone Rodriguez, Lauren Perry, Lauren Herda, Gabriella Downey, and Brad Simpson. And this one says Tony Flex, Trish Forstner, Brad Simpson, and Tone Rodriguez. And this one, I, I really wanted this specific cover because if you don't know, I'm a horror movie fanatic. And this reminds me a lot, and I do think it is based on Trick or Treat. Um, the movie and this one it's strangely familiar but I don't know where I've seen this it's kind of a psychic uh, admissions thingy I don't know but I, I do want to read it and I'm fairly excited to do so so that is going to be all for this book haul not as big as January's thank the Lord but still fairly interesting, fairly good, and I hope that you guys enjoy this video. If you know any of these, please tell me something in the comments down below. If you don't and you're excited to read it, tell me so as well. And that's going to be all for today. Happy readings to you all. Bye! Should I give up or should I just keep chasing pavements even if it leads nowhere? Oh, would it be a waste? Even if I knew my pain, would I leave it there? Would I give up or should I just keep on chasing pavements? Should I just keep chasing pavements? Oh.